Uh, hi everybody, my name is Stephanie Gray, um, and that light is way too bright directly into my eyeballs if I stand over here, oh my god. Um, I work for a company called Agile 6 Applications, and I serve as the help desk manager for the VA.gov CMS. Uh, I'm usually trying to help solve everybody's Drupal problems all at once, but these are different sort of problems that I'm here to solve today. Um, before I begin, uh, I just want to start by saying that working remotely has been absolutely life-changing for me. Um, about a decade ago, when I used to work in the traditional office, and many tech companies have the whole open office plan, uh, those were a sensory nightmare for me. Um, oh my gosh, this person's clicking their pen, this person's on the phone, this person typed so loud, why is that guy microwaving tuna? <laughs> Offices were a sensory hellscape for me. But once I started working remotely, and instantly at the same time entered the world of Drupal about eight years ago, it was absolutely revolutionary for me. And I really want to pay it forward back to the Drupal community by talking about um, things that have been able to help me as a remote employee, um, ways to help other neurodivergent remote employees, and ultimately to just make the workforce a better place for neurodivergent individuals in general. So. That's my introduction slide, but I just gave it, so let's move on to the one after that. Before I begin, I want to provide some useful definitions uh, of a lot of terms I'm going to be using a lot throughout this presentation. So neurodiversity, uh, it's a framework. It's the idea of celebrating mental differences like autism, ADHD, CPTSD, dyslexia, OCD, and other conditions or neurotypes as natural variations amongst humans and amongst cognitive abilities, uh, and promoting acceptance, understanding, and inclusion rather than viewing these things as pathologized deficits that uh, are terrible and evil and scary and need to be eradicated. Um, these are just not different ways that humans are formed and different ways that we move through the world and perceive the world. The term neurodivergent, which I'll uh, refer to on some slides as ND, refers to uh, individuals with atypical neurological development. Um, again, it's not saying that these conditions aren't necessarily disabilities, um, but many of the aspects that make them disabling are due to social and societal barriers. Um, neurodivergent people may experience, interpret, and interact with the world in unique ways. And neurotypical is just about everybody else. Please don't be offended by that if you're within this group. Um, neurotypical folks uh, are individuals who think, perceive, and communicate in ways that are just considered the norm by the general population, considered the default. So neurodiversity is a pretty big umbrella, acknowledging that everyone's built a little bit different, and it involves both neurodivergent and neurotypical folks. There are so many strengths involved with having a neurodiverse team. Uh, it's pretty boring when everybody on your team is wired the exact same way, right? Um, neurodivergent folks in your team can provide broader perspectives, very innovative thinking, um, a lot of analytical, logical, pattern-oriented thinking that you otherwise might not get with just neurotypical folks, um, enhanced attention to detail and focus, diverse problem-solving abilities, um, a lot of dedication and resilience, um, certainly a lot of loyalty to your team if it's an inclusive atmosphere. Uh, they may bring empathy and user-centered design, especially when it comes to government work and accessibility. Uh, there's a competitive advantage, of course, to having an array of different thinkers on your team. Um, neurodivergent folks may also have stronger uh, memory abilities, and again, that detail-oriented work goes a long way in our field. And overall, a commitment to equality and fairness. Um, here's a full quote that I took from Harvard Business Review about how neurodiversity programs compel companies and leaders to adopt a style of management that uh, emphasizing placing each employee in a context that maximizes his or her contributions. So I don't think that we should value humans entirely based on productivity, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, and this is uh, tied to this quote, um, autistic individuals are about 90 to 140% more productive than neurotypical individuals. So again, there is a huge competitive advantage here. But wait, 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 hold on, we're all in tech. We've heard this stuff before, right? Like, why are we still discussing the need for neurodiversity in 2023? Well, a close friend of mine from the Drupalverse who may or may not be at DrupalGovCon right now with us, um, she was experiencing some communications difficulties at her job with being misread and a little bit misunderstood. Um, she's a nice, friendly, wonderful sweetheart of an individual and 
she planned a one-on-one -on -one with her boss in order to disclose the fact that she's also sick. Um, he didn't take it well. Can't say I'm a fan of this guy either. Um, his response to her uh, disclosure was, well, I don't get why you're telling me this. Why do you need a label? How does this change anything at all? You just need to go for more walks. Uh, it, it was absolutely terrible. She left that meeting feeling disgraced and shut down. And this really just points to the fact that there is a lack of awareness on multiple fronts um, of how all of these things affect neurodivergent individuals, including uh, how diagnosis may affect you. Um, you know, even if you're diagnosed late in life, uh, you know, you may have always known that you were different. You may have always internalized that as depression, anxiety, self-hatred, not knowing why you felt so different from everybody. Um, and knowing what your operating system runs on can be um, very life-changing and very positive in many ways. Um, how your communication style may differ, you know, that's an important thing to be able to discuss with your boss and your colleagues openly and honestly. Um, there's also a lack of awareness on how to support neurodivergent colleagues. There's biases, misconceptions, and stigma, some of those nasty negative things that unfortunately I'll need to get into a little, in a little bit from now. There's the fear of disclosure itself and running into is issues that my friend had faced. Uh, there's fear of exclusion post-disclosure and being treated differently, being potentially infantilized. Um, there's the subject of accommodations, whether to seek accommodations and, oh gosh, am I asking too much by asking for accommodations? Um, are they going to think I want, like, you know, special treatment or the right carpet? And as a manager or a boss, whether to provide those accommodations and how that process may work. Um, but ultimately, fostering inclusive practices, it's something that I think a lot of companies and uh, employers are still working on. And there's so many benefits for employee retention and just creating inclusive teams in general. So let's talk about some of those biases and microaggressions to avoid. Uh, the first step that I've got right here, oversimplification and stereotyping. Please do not use legitimate medical issues as like just self-deprecating humor if you don't actually fall under that diagnosis. So try to avoid things like, oh, I am so ADHD, I am so OCD. Um, also things like, oh, that project or that client totally gave me PTSD. Please don't do that. Um, I've also encountered this one personally in a past job. Um, there was someone in a leadership position at my job who used on the spectrum as shorthand for weird or off-putting when describing a very unsavory individual. Um, this person could have just described the guy as unsavory or used those direct terms, like on the spectrum should not be used um, as shorthand for negative traits. It's just not a nice thing to do. Um, also, please don't ask people inappropriate questions or comments. Um, there's a story I told before uh, involving, well, why do you need a label? Well, sometimes labels can be a good thing. If you go into your kitchen pantry and someone took all the labels off the soup cans, you're not going to know what you're going to get on the inside. Uh, and aside from that, again, having a diagnosis can be a very powerful thing um, that gives you a framework for how to proceed in one's life and one's work. Um, there's also, well, you don't look that way to me. You don't seem like you have that issue. Are you sure that your diagnosis is correct? That is between someone and their doctor. That, that is not between you as colleagues. Uh, that's a HIPAA violation, like five steps away from a HIPAA violation right there. Like, if someone is giving you a diagnosis, like, just trust that they know what they're talking about. Um, there's also patronizing language and cancelization that people face, like, oh my god, like, if you have ADHD, you're autistic, oh, but you're so smart, you're so capable and articulate. Thanks. Like, that makes me feel weird. Thank you, I guess. Uh, oh, you, you can't have that. Ugh, you're not like my eight-year-old nephew. Well, yes, because no one is forcing me to go to Walmart in itchy clothes. I am a grown adult. I can go to Target in comfy clothes. That is why I'm not like your eight-year-old nephew. So ultimately, there are still so many narrow, just ignorant, naive things that folks say, and I think some of us have fallen into these traps before. I don't mean to be preachy or say, like, oh, all these ableist biases, all of you people keep using them. But I have encountered most of these in everyday life and just all of the different things I read about um, the workforce and really just want to pass on, like, what's good to do and not do. Here's where it gets even more awkward. Let's keep going with another big myth. 
Um, another one that I have heard so many times and seen in many places is, oh, everybody's a little bit on the spectrum. Oh, everybody's autistic these days. Everybody's a little bit autistic. No, that's not how it works. Um, autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental condition that has specific diagnostic criteria. It's sort of like how there's a lot of people out there with blood sugar and insulin resistance issues, but they're not necessarily diabetic. You either are or you aren't. Um, it's a diagnosis. Again, uh, you know, if you do uh, identify with autistic traits, you should you know, talk to a medical professional about that, but I'm a dribbler, not a doctor, so let's keep going. Um, the autism spectrum is not a linear scale from less autistic to more autistic. It's more like a variable color wheel right here, the whole mixed bag of traits. And these characteristics might vary in how they manifest and how intense they are for each autistic individual. Um, so if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. You cannot assume that every autistic person you meet is going to have the exact same traits or the same personality type even. Um, they may have completely different um, traits when it comes to eye contact, executive functioning, something I'll get into in a bit, um, sensory sensitivities, things like that. So spectrum is more of a big old rainbow wheel and each autistic person you know, has a mixed bag of these traits. So it's a wide array of strengths, challenges, and support needs for each individual. It's not everybody. Neither are you aren't. There's another myth um, that I have encountered and that friends of mine have encountered within the workforce. Um, it's just a casual statement of, oh, everybody's claiming that they have the autism or the ADHD these days. This comment pushes the harmful assumption that anybody who claims to have these things is faking or lying. Um, similar comments to that include, oh, you're just trying to be trendy. What? Uh, did TikTok convince you of this? Oh, you just want attention. Please be aware that someone who is disclosing these things in you know, their 30s, 40s, 50s in the workforce, they, they are not trying to impress the TikTok teens or get attention. <laughs> they are seeking support, understanding, and potential accommodations. There's also, oh, stop trying to make it your whole personality. Well, when someone finally figures out what their operating system is running on, it, it already was their way of being. It's, you know, they're not trying to make it their whole personality. Um, Oh, you just want an excuse to act like a jerk. You just want special treatment. Oh, it's just overdiagnosed these days. All of these statements are very harmful and push a lot of ableist biases and assumptions. So, also very good to avoid. And speaking of this overdiagnosed thing right here, I've got this graphic over here of the woman saying, oh, but I, you know, they're telling me these things, but I, I just spent two grand out of pocket on hours of neuropsychological testing with three different autism specialized practitioners. Like, no, I'm 45, I did not get this from TikTok. Like, that is the actual experience of getting autism testing as an adult. It's often extremely expensive and not covered by insurance. So, trust people when they say it. But here's some facts related to the fact that you have probably seen that diagnosis rates of ADHD and autism have uh, increased recently. Not due to the TikTok teens. Uh, Early autism research and testing only included men and boys. Um, actually, there used to be something called the extreme male brain hypothesis, where there's this whole idea that, oh, autism only affects dudes because they got extreme male brain. Um, that led to a lot of gender bias in testing and research and diagnosis of women and girls. Women born before 1990 largely just were not tested, so it didn't matter if you learned how to read at age two, if you were dead last to tie your shoes, if all of your grandma's home movies show you not making eye contact with anyone, if you obsessively watched the Weather Channel, and if you repeatedly watched the same VHS tape about hurricanes over and over and over again as a little girl, women born before 1990 simply weren't tested. And the kids who weren't tested largely had more severe developmental delays. They weren't just obsessive little weather nerds. Um, Asperger's syndrome, uh, which is a term we no longer use because Hans Asperger was a Nazi. He wanted the high-functioning autistics to be retained for the work camps. He wanted the low-functioning autistics to be killed off. Terrible person. We don't use his name anymore. I guess what you would now call it is low support needs autism or high-functioning autism. It wasn't even listed in the DSM until 1994. So another reason why you have generations of girls and women who were completely missed. Um, 
Autism and ADHD also have a 50 to 70% overlap per the NIH, but per the DSM, those two things couldn't be diagnosed together until 2013. So you have a lot of folks who were diagnosed with ADHD who had no idea they were autistic and vice versa. Uh, and two of the saddest facts right here, um, this is very fun at parties. Um, women with autism and ADHD were historically more likely to be diagnosed uh, as having bipolar disorder or borderline personality disorder. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with having either of those things. But generally, uh, for many, many decades, doctors would say, oh, you want to spend a whole weekend reading about the history of 20th century shipwrecks? That can't be due to intellectual reasons or an interest in that subject. That's clearly a chemical imbalance. That's not uh, in such a great outcome for a lot of women and girls who have, you know, unpacked that over the years and learned, you know. But their actual deal is after internalizing a lot of depression, anxiety, do these misdiagnoses. It's a whole thing. Um, also, neurodivergent individuals who are black or Hispanic were historically and still are more likely to be misdiagnosed behavioral or conduct disorders, such as oppositional defiance disorder. Um, this has a whole lot to do with incarceration rates and treatment within the criminal justice system, as well as treatment by the police and police violence. It's absolutely horrible, and if I talk about that aspect for too long, I will probably cry, so let's move on. Uh, ultimately, the neurodiversity movement is really important because accepting our differences means no more broken thumbs. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, over here on the left, so it's about left-handedness, um, we've got the, the history of the rate of left-handedness going from 1880 to 2000. So around the time when there was a lot of stigma and bias about left-handedness being evil and sinister, um, that's around the time when rates started dropping, and my great-grandpa Benny over here, born in 1907, had a teacher just break his thumb. She just thought, oh, left-handedness is evil, this is wrong. She just broke his thumb. There's a lot of lefties in my family, and this story has been repeated to me many times. Um, once that stigma started lifting, you see the rates of left-handedness increase. And it's, it's not due to microchips in the drinking water or something like that. It's literally just ending the stigma and the shame cause those rates to eventually correct and level out. So let's not uh, break anyone's thumbs here, literally or metaphorically. And you know, it was necessary to include a photo with a dog after all of those really sad facts before. <laughs> all right, well, let's get into the brain science of neurodivergence. Let's talk about executive functioning. Um, the brain's executive function, is there a function of the frontal lobe? Um, executive functioning can be affected um, with a number of neurodivergent conditions. So autism, ADHD, um, PTSD can also affect the brain's executive functions, OCD, dyslexia, um, many, many uh, conditions of neurodivergence tie into executive functioning. Now, executive functioning, the way to remember that term it's sort of, uh, what would an executive hire an intern to help them out with, or an assistant? So it's a spectrum of abilities, another spectrum here, um, that includes time management, organization, task management, prioritization, order of operations, and working memory. Executive functioning does not have anything to do with IQ or intelligence, though. So uh, Einstein, for example, most likely had very poor executive functioning because uh, when it, he passed away and uh, the paparazzi went into his office to take photos, uh, it was just stacks and stacks of paper all over. Uh, right up until his passing, uh, Einstein was very, very terribly disorganized. And again, nothing to do with intelligence, but these uh, can be issues for neurodivergent individuals. There's also the issue of time blindness. Um, it's not just time management and figuring out when to do things in order of operations, but Time blindness uh, can be explained as, oh, I'm just going to work on that thing for 10 or 15 minutes. Oh my god, 40 minutes have passed? Four hours have passed? Being so focused on the task that the time just slips right by. Um, so, I don't know if you could see the whole spectrum of executive function right here, um, but there's a whole lot involved. Um, these, these things can be affected for neurodivergent folks, like I said, but providing tools and resources to support your teammates with executive functioning deficits can help your team as a whole. So ways to support workers and colleagues with executive function challenges. 
um, reduce unnecessary notifications and meetings uh, in order to reduce their overall cognitive load, as well as potential sensory overload from staring at the screen for too long. You can provide clear task descriptions and clearly defined steps, resolution, uh, visual scheduling tools to organize tasks and deadlines can be very helpful. Checklists for recurrent tasks so that folks don't have to figure out the steps and the order of operations each time that they perform these tasks. Structured schedules with consistent start and end times, calendar notifications, reminders, and alarms. I'm a huge fan of this one. Whiteboards, just whiteboards all over. Just cover your whole space in whiteboards and post-it notes, honestly, because once you're able to see all of the tasks, uh, you know, even if you get 5,000 Slack notifications in a row, you're generally not going to forget about them. Uh, and just an open dialogue regarding one's daily balance. In the last two companies I've worked at, uh, we would start meetings by checking in about our balance scores, and this is a great way to be able to express your over workload, overall workload or cognitive load by saying, oh, my balance is an eight today, I'm feeling really good, things are nice, or oh, my balance is a three, uh, there's a lot going on. You don't necessarily have to overshare and explain, uh, I don't know, my hot water heater blew up and all of these terrible things are happening. But you can express through that number on a scale of one to ten how you're generally doing that day and really inform other folks in your team about your overall cognitive load. And you know, if you're having trouble with things like time management and organization, you might be able to seek more help based on your personal balance and how those things are going. Uh, there's a lot of very specific challenges for autistic workers as well. Um, sensory overload can be physically distressing, um, and generally in a remote workforce, uh, if you're in control of your sensory environment, that's not a huge issue, like you don't have that terrible office environment where that person's microwaving fish. Uh, but on the other hand, if someone is dealing with, uh, let's say, construction next door to their workspace, uh, or eight hours of Zoom meetings in a row, and their eyes feel like they're just going to fall out of their head, it can be very physically and mentally distressing to deal with. Um, there's also the challenges of missing hints or cues that were implied but never directly stated. Um, difficulty reading the emotions and intentions of others, such as difficulty reading facial expressions and body language, little cues like that, which still have an impact uh, when you're working over Zoom. Uh, for autistic individuals, your facial expressions and your tone of voice might not always match your internal emotions. So you might have a flat affect or if you're a woman who has socially corrected your entire life, uh, you might come off a little too intense or too dramatic. Uh, but regardless, your expressions and your tone of voice may not match what's going on within, how you feel about situations. And in general, autistic individuals may need additional time to process their thoughts when speaking. And it doesn't point to being stupid or slow or anything like that. Um, it's just additional time to gather one's thoughts. There's a member of my team who's autistic who he thinks in pictures and visuals. He doesn't think in language. So when he takes long pauses while speaking, it's to translate all of those images into words, which personally I think is really cool. So I'm all right with his long pauses, even if I'm on the interrupty side of things as a person. Um, these misperceptions lead to a lot of negative bias. Um, Someone's directness may be perceived as rudeness or impatience. Um, you know, if someone is saying, oh, I just want to hop on that task immediately because I'm so focused right now and I just want to get the thing done. It might be taken as, oh, look at you, you know, jumping in and stepping on everybody's toes. Um, there's so many different ways that directness can be mis uh, perceived as rude or impatient, especially in a cultural context, you know. Um, I've found that my own directness is taken a lot better by folks from certain parts of the country, like New York City and Boston, uh, and I see a Bostonian laughing right here, versus folks uh, who I've had some communication challenges with, like from the upper Midwest, where you know, you're know you socialized to be a little less direct than I am, so there could be some clashes there. Um, ultimately, it's good to have a, an open emotional dialogue and be able to work things out, especially with remote teams that are distributed across all 50 states. Um, difficulties with eye contact, which isn't as big of an issue when you're looking at a camera, but you know this still affects hiring practices, especially in a hybrid space. Um, those difficulties might be perceived as shifty or dishonest, like, oh, they're not looking at me, they're hiding something. Um, or they stare at the monitor for way too long and their eyes are hurting and they just want to be able to speak while you know, looking at something that's not a screen. Uh, another really depressing thing now, this is my final bullet point, um, is that thin slice judgments, those split second judgments, like before the real first impression has even really been established, um, 
there is a scientific study, which I've cited right here, if you want to look it up, just look up uh, neurodivergence and slice judgments. Uh, neurotypical people are more likely to encounter an autistic person and have negative impressions and negative bias like within seconds of meeting them. Um, something about the eye contact and the body language, it just leads to immediate rejection and ex exclusion. Um, it, it's just a very upsetting topic to talk about. I'm, Fortunately, there is a silver lining to it. Uh, within that study, once people found out that they were interacting with an autistic individual, the outcomes got better. Um, a lot of the biases were dropped. Um, but there is this like overall mistrust. And even you know when they don't know it's an autistic person, they go, oh, something's off about them. I just don't like something about them. Oh, you know, I should probably listen to my gut. They're probably a bad person. When no, they just carry themselves and speak differently and move through the world in different ways. But fortunately, being informed about these biases and judgments can help us avoid them. Uh, and also just raising awareness of how those traits may, different, may differ amongst people. I hate that topic. I hate the thin slice judgments thing. I think people are mean and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so if you felt empathetic for autistic folks upon hearing that, good. Because that puts us one step closer to solving the double empathy problem. The double empathy problem was, is uh, it's a philosophy that was devised in 2012 by an autistic researcher, Dr. Damian Milton, uh, who proposed that the challenges in social communication between autistic and non-autistic people, um, it's not due to a lack of empathy on one side. It's due to issues of empathy on both sides of the equation. Um, it's about mutual misunderstandings and differences rather than a one-sided deficit. Um, I think autistic folks are often uh, asked, well, you need to accommodate neurotypical folks, you need to learn how to socialize like this, this, and this. And really the onus is on them rather than having that sort of understanding coming from both sides about how those communications may differ. Uh, and this is just another myth that's really, really important to dispel. Autistic people do not lack empathy. They just express it differently. Um, folks who are autistic may have deficits in cognitive empathy, so that's being able to read how someone feels based on facial expressions and social cues, and I guess just being psychic and knowing how everyone feels at any given time, like, what is that expectation even? Um, autistic folks may have deficits in cognitive empathy, but it, they might have higher levels, and often do have higher levels of it. it it's literally called hyper-empathy. Um, sorry. I'm speaking too fast because I really care about this subject and it makes me mad that people feel that way. Um, autistic folks often have higher levels of effective empathy, which is feeling along with someone. So a scenario to explain this is basically, um, you know, someone might not be able to read how you're feeling based off of your facial expression or your body language, especially if you're like, oh, I'm fine, it's fine. They'll probably take you at your word and be like, oh, well, they said they're fine, so it's fine, okay. Um, oh, you should have guessed how I was feeling. I didn't know you said you were fine. But the same person, if you just tell them, oh, I'm feeling this way because X, Y, Z, they'll likely say, oh my gosh, I had no idea that happened. I'm so sorry. How can I help you? How can I support you? Honestly, that's, that's the difference between someone who's autistic and someone who just does not care. Like, if somebody doesn't care, if you tell them, oh, I'm feeling this way because X, Y, Z, they're going to say, oh. Well, how does that affect me? Generally, if you just tell the autistic person, hey, this is deal, they'll say, oh my god, how can I be there for you? Oh my god, I can't believe that happened. I'm so sorry. Um, and they might not express it in those words. Again, it might be flat affect. It might not be the facial expressions or the tone that you express. But the empathy is there. It is just expressed differently. If something happens to you and you know, I write you Russian poetry about it and you don't understand, it's not that I didn't care, it's just in a different language. Um, and another thing that I've seen recently um, that's important to uh, address, I've, I've seen like memes and videos and stuff about like, oh, I, I hate when people, I, I hate when you're telling a story about something that happened to you and then someone tells a story about something that happened to them. It's so selfish and so narcissistic. No, it's not. Folks autism and ADHD often express empathy by mirroring the experience that you're sharing. Um, like, oh my god, I can't believe this thing happened to me. Oh, I'm not trying to one-up you. 
I'm not trying to say that my thing is worse. I'm just trying to express that I know how you feel and I'm here for you because I've been through a similar thing. So when that happens, please don't take it as self-centeredness or narcissism. It's literally just a neurodivergent expression of empathy. Um, ultimately, the more you learn about how empathy differs amongst individuals and how it's expressed, you'll see that the empathy is there. It's, it's a horrible dehumanizing myth to say that neurodivergent people just lack empathy outright. It's just mean. But these myths are slowly being dispelled over time. Slowly. Get rid of them. So let's talk about fostering better communication practices um, amongst teammates as a whole, whether you're neurotypical, neurodivergent, or haven't figured out what your whole deal is yet. Um, plain language and clearly stated directives and expectations help everybody. Well, just avoid vagueness and ambiguity. It's really best to provide context. Um, very logically minded individuals do want to hear the who, what, when, where, why of a situation in order to get the full perspective and figure out how to solve whatever problem is at hand. Um, be direct and explicit, especially when there's specific project guidelines, hierarchies to uphold, <laughs> boundaries to uphold, uh, or crucial project milestones to meet. Um, please use visuals to explain these processes and hierarchies whenever possible. You can use tools like Mural. Um, there's so many fantastic diagramming tools out there. MindNode, um, to be able to explain these things that when they're explained just in the middle of a Zoom meeting, you know, if someone's exhausted that, that day, they've got a whole bunch of cognitive overload, um, they may not be able to break down those steps as easily if they, as if they're officially explained. Regular check-ins help to bridge commun communication gaps before they happen. Uh, and generally, just try to avoid dropping hints and using buzzwords and idioms that you might take for granted. The hints thing gets annoying in terms of, well, you know, I implied that. They should have known that. And the buzzwords and the idioms, I mean, if, if you have folks on a team who come from different cultural backgrounds, folks from other countries, and folks from different linguistic backgrounds, um, it just helps to avoid those things in general. And honestly, for people with sensory issues who take things very literally, I'd like to speak for us as demographic that we freaking hate terms like eating our own dog food. Every time I hear this phrase, I don't know why tech loves this phrase so much, I take it very literally about eating dog food, and I kind of just gag and wince a little bit, like, oof, oh, oh, no. So please don't use phrases like that. Just be as direct as possible. I don't know why the dog food phrase gets used so often. I don't want to picture Alpo during a meeting. Um, and direct feedback is so important. Um, I think that there should be a ban completely on the compliment sandwich. Uh, there was a position I held about a decade ago where management insisted that all feedback must be given in the form of a compliment sandwich. So, oh, you know, if you if you have to say something negative to someone, put it put it in between slices of positive bread. Tell them a positive thing and then the negative thing and then another positive thing. Um, for many folks who are on the receiving end of that feedback, they're just going to have the negative thing overshadowed by the two positive things, and they're not really going to get the point of what you're trying to tell them to improve upon. Um, it really obscures things, and something that I've said when asking managers for direct feedback is like, if, if you're going to serve me a poop sandwich, just serve it directly. Like, Don't waste the bread. Just put it on the platter and just give it to me. It's just great. I can take it. Um, not the best metaphor, and anyone here who takes things literally, they probably don't like that I use the food platter metaphor. But uh, still, ban the compliment sandwich. You know, give that feedback directly, and both positive and negative performance feedback should be taken, should be distributed directly. Um, the problem with missing social cues is is that like there's this whole focus, especially about autistic folks, on missing social cues of, oh, stop talking. Uh, we don't want to hear you talk about that thing anymore. Oh, don't sit with us. Missing those cues, which is ultimately really horrible and is not fun on the schoolyard at all. Um, the flip side of that is also missing the cues of, oh, you're awesome. We, we want you here. Your work is great. Keep talking about that thing. We love hearing you talk about that thing. Your work is so important and meaningful. If you miss social cues in general, you also miss we want you here and we appreciate you. So you've got to say those things directly. So when you don't have that feedback, like it causes a lot of anxiety. And when you don't know that you're doing awesome, it just, you know, it's sort of like driving without a speedometer. Like 
going too slow, am I going too fast? I have no clue. There's no data telling me how I'm doing here. Um, and I have pushed back with performance feedback with a past manager, and I've tried to explain that the not having performance feedback really disadvantages uh, neurodivergent folks. Uh, he said to me, oh, Stephanie, you're, you're smart. You'll figure it out. You, you know how you're doing. I don't. You have to tell me. If I'm walking around with spinach in my teeth and no one tells me all day, I'm going to come home and just go, oh my gosh, they did not like, respect me. No one, no one told me about the spinach in my teeth. I don't always know how I'm doing. And this is the same for a lot of neurodivergent folks. So just be honest and direct, whether it's positive feedback or negative. Just you know, tell people directly. Here's some examples of indirect versus direct communication. It's very indirect to say, well, we've been seeing a lot of user feedback about this bug. It can be direct by saying, please prioritize this bug. It affects a significant number of users. It's very indirect to say, oh, this feature is something we're really looking forward to. Uh, you could just say directly, hey, is it possible to complete this feature before the end of sprint? It's very indirect to say, well, you know, you've been pretty quiet the last few meetings. Direct. Uh, hey, is your current workload manageable? You need any assistance? Uh, you need any adjustments? Just you know, let me know. Let's check in about that. And it's a little indirect to say, hmm, how's everything going with the project? It's more direct to say, hey, can you provide an update on your progress? Got any roadblocks? You know, um, there's a lot of ways to be very vague, um, but you, know, you could just save everyone a lot of time and energy by stating the thing directly. There's also uh, the issue of receiving communication from neurodivergent folks without misreading it or misperceiving their intentions. Um, so if someone says, hey, can you explain what you meant by that? It might be misinterpreted as, well, you're not making any sense when what they were actually saying is that they just need more details and context. Um, if someone says, you know, I'm not coming to the virtual happy hour tonight, uh, it might be misinterpreted as, oh, I hate all my colleagues, I'm not a team player, I'm antisocial, when really their energy levels are just depleted for the day and they need some rest. Or just, they don't have it in them to socialize. Um, a neuro neurodivergent person might say, have we considered trying a different approach to this problem? They're not saying, oh, your solution sucks, your ideas are terrible, I do not like them at all. Um, and again, this, you know, I'm explaining all of this with my quirky, intense, whatever the heck you want to call my whole personality. And someone else might be saying this in a very flat voice with a very flat affect or facial expression. So it might be taken as rude, like, have we considered trying a different approach to this problem? They're not necessarily saying, your ideas are terrible and I hate them. Um, they are likely just logically trying to solve the problem by approaching all possible solutions. Uh, it's also very helpful to foster inclusive meetings in general. Uh, so for meetings, clear agendas can be very helpful to all attendees and uh, sending out free meeting materials in advance. Uh, even if you send them five minutes before the meeting, which I have never been guilty of. <laughs> uh, providing guidelines for what is expected of each participant can be very helpful, um, as well as structured participation, taking turns speaking. Uh, an aspect of both autism and ADHD is not knowing when to speak in conversations. So aside from potentially being too quiet to speak up, uh, you may have the flip side of that, which is oh, everyone thinks I'm a rude jerk because I don't actually know when to speak even after decades of knowing how to use phones and computers and conversations. I have never encountered that problem at all. Um, consistent meeting times week to week can be very helpful as well, especially with planning out one's own cognitive and like social load and social balance and just having the battery to be able to deal with other human beings that day. Uh, use of visual aids when explaining processes, I have covered that before, still incredibly helpful, um, especially because another trait that comes with autism and ADHD, there's so much overlap there when it comes to traits, it's uh, difficulties with audio processing. Um, so again, when those processes are just explained directly uh, in a meeting, and there's no text, there's no visuals or anything, um, some of those steps might be missed. So, it's have visuals. Uh, always get to have written summaries of takeaways and action items after the meeting. I know when I've been in like eight Zoom meetings in a row, I can't remember what we decided we were going to do after uh, meeting number six. 
So having those action items just laid out directly, super helpful. Uh, and flexible participation options. I know a lot of companies insist on camera on hot take, but I think uh, having camera optional really helps a lot of folks, uh, especially again, if you're in Zoom meeting number eight and your eyes are aching and you just wanna lay on the couch and listen and still take in everything that's happening, but maybe not necessarily show your exhausted face. Again, your face might be taken the wrong way. So just some tips on inclusive meetings. Um, there's a lot more information out there on how to make meetings uh, more inclusive for neurodiverse teams, and I encourage reading them, especially if you are a manager or boss. Uh, all in all, it's just best to assume that everyone is trying their best. When it comes to a lot of those communications difficulties, it's really helpful for all involved to just err with, on the side of people mean what they say and they say what they mean. Uh, and you know, I use this uh, duck image over here without much explanation, but basically I'm trying to show that um, a lot of folks who are neurodivergent might come off high functioning or low support needs or whatever term you want to use for, oh, whatever the thing is that you say that you deal with, it, it's not that bad. You know, you, you seem like you're perfectly fine. That's not a big deal for you. Just the label. Um, Mm, here's the metaphor of the duck who seems like they're they're swimming, you know, perfectly fine and calmly on the water, but you don't really see beneath the water how hard their their little ducky feet are paddling and how exhausted they really are. A lot of neurodivergent folks, um, they have their energy levels affected by cognitive overload or sensory overload throughout the day, um, or just social overload in general. Um, there's so much energy and effort that you don't see neurodivergent people putting in on the day to day. Um, and they're working so hard behind the scenes and it's just not apparent. Um, you only see the duck swimming nicely, but you just don't see the paddling and the exhaustion. So, you know, there's so many assumptions that someone is lazy or stupid or that they just don't care. Um, they might just be exhausted and dealing with executive functioning challenges. So always remember there's, there's people who are putting in so much effort and hard work behind the scenes. Um, and you might only see the superpower side of their brain, like, wow, oh my God, you're the best at spreadsheets and taxonomies and all oh, your productivity is through the roof. You're churning out all this work. But you might not see the ways in which their neurodivergence might be difficult or disabling. So just show up and assume that everyone's trying their best. And I, I know that there are, you know, jerks out there of every variety. We've all encountered them in the workplace. But, you know, a jerk is a jerk and being neurodivergent has nothing to do with that at all. So just assume everyone's trying their best. And if you do run into jerks, that's what HR is for and conflict resolution. <laughs> Here's some more resources that are available. Um, there's the Employer, Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, EARN. Um, they have a lot of great reading materials. There's the Job Accommodation Network, which if you're neurodivergent and need to seek accommodations or read about which accommodations might be possible to work out with your employer under the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, that's JAN at askjan.org. There's also the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, um, because Autism Speaks is terrible, and they do not allow the input of autistic individuals, and Autism Speaks also has horrible TV commercials that are like, Autism is coming to your house and stealing your children. Don't listen to Autism Speaks. Listen to the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Their slogan is, nothing about us without us. Um, they have autistic board members, they have autistic representatives. Like, they're the real deal, and right now they're fighting against um, the fact that it's still legal to pay disabled workers less than minimum wage uh, at the federal level. So they're awesome. The Autistic Advocacy Network, uh, self advocacy networks at autisticadvocacy.org. And I cited a lot of different studies and resources. I know I moved really quickly while throwing all of this information at you. So if anyone has any questions, comments, you want to find out about the sources I cited, any concerns, that's my personal email address. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, please don't give it to spam bots. <laughs> all right, thank you all for attending. Uh, this guy back here, who I don't know and I've never seen in my life. No. Um, hey, I'm Dan Gurin, Dan Gur. Um, and I would love to continue this conversation with uh, you know, this community. Um, I created a birds of a feather space tomorrow after lunch. It's at 1.15. Um, that's basically this. 
Um, so if people want to join that, and I think it, I heard that it's in the penthouse of this hotel is where the, the bathroom is. Remember that? Is. Yeah, I guess it's on the top. <coughs> so there's that. And then um, I also um, started a company called Atypical Savant, and we focus on autistic and neurodivergent partnerships. So we love to just you know connect with this community and stuff. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Uh, yes. right um, I, so I had a question just about the accommodations, because that's not something that I've considered previously. And I'm curious, what kind of job accommodations have you seen or heard that people have actually been able to request and ideally have implemented? That is a great question, because disclosure is a personal choice, yes. um, because you run the risk of all those biases and assumptions that I had mentioned, and that that is a whole can of worms right there. But when it comes to the accommodations process, um, it's something that you can work out with your employer. And it's sort of like, well, uh, I am in a wheelchair. I need a wheelchair ramp to be built. I would like it to be built to these specifications. Well, we don't have those building materials or the budget. What if we built it to these specifications and moved it to this end of the building? Would that still be OK? Generally, the accommodations process is interactive. And um, if you do not work for a terrible toxic employer who shuts you down when you ask, uh, which, you know, that's a violation of the ADA. Generally, you will go back and forth with the folks in charge of accommodations and be able to work out um, things based on your personal needs and support levels. I am uh, fully understanding that anybody could be neurodivergent. Um, I have seen in my experience, at least in my current company, that in the development department, there seems to be more folks that are more divergent than in other departments. Um, I, did, I wanted to ask you, in your experience, is that because neurodivergent, and I don't I'm not group people, right, but are more keen to development roles, or is it because development developers in general foster a, an environment where it's more welcoming and people are more open about it than other departments where it might be, for all the reasons you just said, it might not be as great to let people know what they're doing. Uh, it's, it's sort of both. Um, I think there's a lot of neurodivergent traits. For example, having um, a different circadian rhythm than most people, being a hardwired night owl. Um, if someone pushes code at 2 AM, generally no one blinks an eye. Um, this is something where, in a more traditional line of work, um, you know, it might be seen as, hey, you, you OK, dude? Um, I think that there's more of an allowance for neurodivergent traits uh, amongst developers, but uh, also the culture of tech allows for more acceptance and inclusion. But we're all very privileged from being in tech, because 85%, um, according to the last stats I looked up, 85% of autistic individuals are unemployed or underemployed. So we are in a safe, secure, happy little bubble over here, thinking everything is all peachy. Uh, outside of it, it's terrible, and people are getting paid less than minimum wage. Um, I have a question about uh, networking in the workplace and just, uh, or I guess just um, if you have any tips, thoughts, accommodations you could ask for in the workplace for that type of informal, you know, networking is, it's who you know. That's how you get jobs, unfortunately, right? And so for somebody who might not be super comfortable socializing or doesn't have the energy levels to go to an after work thing where all the magic happens or whatever. Um, how does one navigate that and still get some networking done? Oh god, I don't have any great answers to that. I had to be taught to network. Networking used to make me want to rip my face off and scream and cry. I, I absolutely hated it. The idea of having to like schmooze and everything. Like I I spent decades trying to appear like socially normal. And anyone here who's worked with me knows that I am not. So like the whole idea of having to do the song and dance of like, hey, I'm the good American capitalist employee. Let's do on my plan. Um, that just, it, oh, it made my skin crawl. Um, honestly, it was a tech boot camp that I did in 2014 that taught me how to network and made it feel a lot less skeevy to me. Um, just learning about how to network, like the purpose of it, um, these are the strategies. You show up um, you know, having these sort of things prepared, knowing what you're going to talk about. It took away a lot of the just fear and, and grossness of it for me, and I felt a lot more comfortable. But ultimately, ugh, it's it's just something you kind of have to brute, brute force yourself into, and that's my personal perspective. I'm, I'm sure there's many, many articles out there on LinkedIn about 
how to be Miss Perfect Sally LinkedIn, but <laughs> that ain't me. Uh, your, your first anecdote about the woman who went to her manager um, to disclose, what would have been a positive interaction and positive outcome of that disclosure? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so certainly nothing negative, like, oh, autism diagnosis, your life must be ruined. But no, she's already there. She's already a genius engineer at that company. Um, the fact that she knows what her deal is now, and again, you know, it's the metaphor of what her operating system runs on, um, it doesn't really change anything about her day to day. She just has a name for it now and has that framework of tools and resources still. Um, so being like, oh, how terrible, oh my god. That's not the right response either. I do think the right response would be, oh, thank you for telling me. Um, is there anything that we could provide that would help make things easier? Um, are there any accommodations that you may be seeking? How can we support you? And that fosters open dialogue. Any other questions, concerns? Is anyone interested in a 90s VHS? <laughs> 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 